In this lecture, we'll be learning about ancient Egypt, the second known civilization. I purposely stripped down the information to the bare minimum, and I just talk about things I believe would benefit every thinking person. Before going into the historical sequences of Egypt, let me first introduce some important facts about them. First, let's look at the geographical location of Egypt, as geography can make history more illuminating. As introduced in the previous lecture on ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt is at the southwest tip of the Fertile Crescent, and that's quite important. Next, we know more about Egyptian history than that of Mesopotamia because the historical records were well documented in Egypt. The writing system the Egyptians used to record documents is called hieroglyphics, which is a form of pictorial writing. We have a lot of written records from around 3200 BC. Now, why might this be the case? Well, archaeological evidence from 4 millennium BC shows that Egyptian and Sumerian civilization came into contact. The most probable explanation is that the Egyptians took inspiration from the Sumerians, which would explain the profound similarity between Egyptian hieroglyphics and Sumerian script, which was called pictograms. If you're a thinker who's interested in learning about the ancient Sumerians, you might enjoy my lecture on ancient Mesopotamia as well. Another important fact about Egypt is the indispensability of the Nile River. One important attribute of the Nile River is that it flooded annually, which means that the land around the Nile was highly suited for agriculture quite reliably. Now, I'm going to go a bit back about the geography, but um, Egypt's geography is separated into two parts, Upper and Lower Egypt. And contrary to what you may assume, Upper Egypt actually refers to the southern part of Egypt, since we're going up the Nile River, and vice versa. And as I've said before, written historical record starts around 3200 BC. However, we have some information about Egypt prior to 3200 BC thanks to archaeological evidences. Now, prior to 3200 BC, Egyptians were situated in Upper Egypt and were organized into clans. And these clans used animals as their clan symbols or totems. The Egyptians had some sophisticated technology back then, such as papyrus boats and copper tools, but they were still relatively primitive. Now this starts to change around 4th millennium BC, which is also around the time the Egyptians come into contact with foreign influences, such as the Sumerians. There is evidence that such trade happened in Lower Egypt. During the 4th millennium BC, two kingdoms emerge, Lower and Upper Kingdom. And this goes back to my previous comment on the geography. Now, although I can't say this with confidence, foreign influence in Lower Egypt may have been an impetus for such clear division between the two kingdoms. The political structure of ancient Egyptian kingdoms was a theocracy, just like Sumer was a theocracy as well. But there is a key difference between the two theocracies. For the Sumerians, or the ancient Mesopotamians, the ruler was a spokesperson of the gods. The ruler was subordinate to the gods. However, for the Egyptians, 
the ruler was a mediator between the gods and the people. So they were quite on the same level. The ruler and the gods more or less you know, held equal status. In fact, the ruler was seen as one of the many Egyptian gods. Now, with those information in mind, let's finally get into the historical written accounts post-3200 BC. First of all, in around 3200 BC, the upper kingdom, down south, conquers the lower kingdom, up north, and unifies Egypt. For a while, Egypt was a formidable civilization, but by 1000 BC, Egypt's greatest days came to an end. The time span between the rise of Egypt in 3200 BC and its sterilization in 1000 BC can essentially be broken down into five periods with one prelude period. The prelude period is called proto-dynastic and not much happens during this time. The five main periods are as follows. The first period is called the Old Kingdom which lasts for about 500 years. Basically, Egyptians were increasing their territory by invading other places. The second period is called the First Intermediate, which for about 100 years, the Egyptians are conquered and ruled by people from Asia. The third period is called the Middle Kingdom, which lasts for about 400 years. And during this time, Egypt's go through many reconstructions and one important result of this was a change in Egyptian theology. The ruler was now seen not as one of the many gods, but the ruler, the god that other gods followed. My speculation is that this allowed for greater stability of the kingdom. The fourth period is called the Second Intermediate. You can probably guess that they got invaded again, and this lasts for a hundred years also. The fifth period is called the New Kingdom, which lasted for about 500 years, and during this time again, the Egyptians drove out the invaders and ended up conquesting parts of Syria and Palestine. As you can tell, the eras are a sequence of Egypt invading and being invaded. Now that we went through the brief timeline of ancient Egypt, I want to get into some interesting information about them. As you probably know, the term pharaoh is understood today as referring to the Egyptian king. However, this attribution only started during the New Kingdom. Before, the term pharaoh referred to the palace the king resided. The term pharaoh literally means great house. While on the topic of the pharaoh, I just want to mention that the king was believed to have the power to control the Nile River and its annual rise and fall. And this would automatically mean that the Egyptians believed their lives depended on the king. Next, I'll briefly talk about Egyptian technology. When many people think of Egypt, they probably think of the pyramids. Yes, the pyramid was a spectacular accomplishment of the Egyptians, and one which we cannot fully explain how it was accomplished. But the administrative aspect also deserves attention. The ancient Egyptians did not have sophisticated tools, but they were able to create such great buildings. Granted, they had the manpower of thousands of slaves, but organizing such number is not easy. To think that the Egyptians accomplished this is pretty astounding. They also had medicine, at least by the Old Kingdom. We also see evidence of contraceptive practices. Another great accomplishment is their calendar. They created a calendar with 365 days with 12 months, each month consisting of 30 days. 
They added extra five days at the end of the year, ascribing each day to one of the key deities in Egyptian mythology. Let's briefly talk about Egyptian mythology. The Egyptian pantheon was huge with over 2,000 gods. There are lots of stories that go along the gods, but for now, I'll just introduce the three key gods. Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris, the main god, was married to the goddess Isis, and Horus was their son. These three gods all are ascribed a day to themselves in the Egyptian calendar. Egyptian art was also largely about the gods, and if you want to know more about Egyptian mythology, please let me know in the comments. Now, as for the Egyptians' worldviews, it was completely symbolic. For modern humans, our worldview is typically completely scientific and unsymbolic, to, to say the least. And for this reason, it will be quite hard for a modern man to fully understand the ancients. One important worldview to mention is their view on death. For them, the afterlife was a good place to go. However, the dead will first need to face judgment by Osiris. To aid in the judgment, people would perform rituals for the dead. Surprisingly, Egyptians spent 70 days to perform funerary and mummification practice for the king. To end this lecture, let me introduce one seemingly crazy Egyptian practice. The pharaoh, or the king, would sometimes marry his own daughter. This is because they believe the throne descended through the female lineage. This also reflects the reality that females were highly regarded in ancient Egypt, which is something that may come as a surprise to some people. I want to improve my quality for future lectures, so I would appreciate any feedback. Or just kindly let me know what was most interesting or if there is anything you want me to further discuss. I truly hope you learned something from this lecture. In summary, ancient Egypt flourished most probably because of foreign influences, notably the Sumerians. One important result is the sophisticated writing system that suddenly seems to appear. The Nile River was the life-bearing force, and ancient Egypt was originally separated into two kingdoms. The lower, up north, and upper kingdom, down south. The two kingdoms were unified around 3200 BC. Ancient Egyptian records can be broken down into five eras. Each era is either one where Egypt invades others or gets invaded. The political structure of the kingdom was a theocracy. And contrary to Mesopotamia, the Egyptian king or pharaoh was a mediator between the gods and people, not a spokesperson of the gods. And it may also be worth knowing that this change in theology in Egypt occurs during the Middle Kingdom. And finally, for the Egyptians, their mythology was very important and their worldview was completely symbolic. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new. If you're interested, please watch my lecture series over here.